welcome. It's great to see you all here. Um, and this is uh, DevOps Oxford Human Ops today. Uh, before we start, I wanted to go through a couple of things about DevOps Oxford. So when I when I arrived here in 2014, there was Oxford Geek Nights, which is a great event. Uh, they would have really cool speakers, um, and Oxford Python, JS Oxford, all great meetups. But there was really nothing for systems or for operations. So we did a bit of Ansible. Oxford and then Docker and then we decided to go full DevOps and just invite everyone in and not not focus on one specific tool um, and so we talked about continuous integration and delivery containers and security uh, big data ops uh, more continuous delivery and uh, config management and we are now more than 300 members and I looked at this and I thought 300 members is great and then I found that uh, DevOps Exchange London has uh, uh, 5,270 members. <laughs> but I did the numbers, right? And if you think about it, <laughs> we're actually three times better than London. <laughs> so we have, yeah. Um, yeah, so today uh, we will talk about human ops. And, um, I actually thought about this today. So I went to training for DevOps people in London. And uh, I looked around the room, and we were all sitting there really tired. Everyone looked really tired, like they hadn't slept for two weeks. Uh, and, uh, and I thought, this is a really good image to kind of bring back here. Um, because when we talk about operations and DevOps, we talk about the tools mainly. So which tech stack do you use, what languages do you know, and we kind of forget about the people. So, you know, like your pe the people you work with, uh, your colleagues, and, uh, and yourself. Like, wh who are you, uh, what, what are you like as a person, and how do you work together with other people? Because uh, in the end, if, if we're just really tired and we're not uh, functioning as people, we're not gonna be very good engineers. So, that's what we're gonna talk about today. And uh, to start, Holly will uh, share confessions uh, on Automation Addict. Let me start by telling you a, a little bit about myself. My name's Holly Cummins. I work for IBM. This is a, a very old business card because I've worked for IBM for a very long time. I've, I've been with IBM for 15 years. Um, in that time, I've worked in a number of roles, which is the great thing about a large company like IBM. So I've worked at the bottom of the stack, I've done JVM performance, I've worked somewhere in the middle of the stack um, on the WebSphere application server. And what I do now is I work on Bluemix, which is very near the top of the stack. So Bluemix is IBM's platform as a service and also IBM software as a service with a bit of infrastructure as a service as well. So really, if you like AWS, you'll love Bluemix. Um, but my, my first confession really is about where I've come from. Um, I've very much come from the dev side of DevOps. I'm not a hardcore ops practitioner. That's not one of the things I've ever done. But just to, to try and establish my qualifications, one of the things I did before my current role is that I, uh, I led delivery for Webster Application Server. And that role, really, we were the, the DevOps team. So I, I had DevOps in my title. So it's OK. I'm allowed to be here. And the, uh, the other confession, going back to the introduction, is that I'm very tired. So I got back quite late from Sweden. So if I fall asleep halfway through the presentation, it's not that you're boring. It's just that I'm tired. So what, what I do with Bluemix is I'm the technical lead for the Bluemix garage in London. And usually when I say that, the first question is, but what is a Bluemix garage? And what we do is we're a startup within IBM. We take the best of the startup world in terms of lean startup, um, and we combine it with the best of IBM in terms of the, the scale and the depth and the technical expertise and different kinds of innovation. And the, the combination is, is quite cool. So I'm going to tell you a bunch of horrible things about myself and the mistakes that I've made. Um, so to make me feel better, I, I'd really love to have a conversation. And if, you, if you're brave enough, tell me about all the times you've tried to automate things and it, it hasn't gone well. 
but it really, I, I've, I've always loved automating things. When I started university, we had um, internet, sort of, but it wasn't broadband, it was dial-up. And so what we had to do was you had to set the modem up to, to get into the university network, and then you'd have to type your username, and you'd have to type, my pass type your password. And this seemed like such a lot of hassle that I had um, an automation tool, and so I, I configured it so that it could trigger the dial-up, trigger the password, trigger the, um, the username, which was all fine, except because it was dial-up, the timing wasn't very precise. So every now and then, it would, it would just print my password in, in clear text on the screen when my friends were around. So that it, it was 80% successful as an automation, which I don't know if, where the bar is, but I think it's probably too low. Um, when I joined IBM, again, showing my age, we, we still did very large design, by which I mean we'd do 100-page design documents at the start of the project. And we'd have many teams, each doing 100-page design documents. And one of the things we'd write in the design documents is all of the interfaces for everything. So pretty much the APIs would have to be documented in paper so that we could transcribe them. And some bright sparks had looked at this and said, you know what, we could improve this process. We might make the documentation more accurate and save a bit of time if we put some automated round tripping. So there's, there was a product called Rational Soda that did this and it, it allowed you to do a bit of round tripping between what you had in the documentation and what you had in the code so that they were sort of in sync with each other. And this was great, but the interface it used was Microsoft Word. And of course I used Linux because it, yeah, Macs weren't available in, in the form that they are now. So I looked at this and I said, well, I don't want to use Windows, but I do want this capability. I know I can rewrite it. So, and I thought, you know, I, I knew LaTeX, so I, I could, you know, script something up and it would take the Java and then it would do use reflection to read the interfaces and then it would generate some LaTeX code and, and that would be fine. And about four weeks later, I surfaced when people were saying, where's the design document? And I said, look, I've reinvented Rational Soda. And they said, but where's the design document that you're supposed to be writing? And so I said, but look, I've reinvented Rational Soda. And not a single person except for me cared about my, my beautiful reinvention of Rational Soda so that I could work on Linux. They cared about the design that I wasn't doing that I was supposed to be doing. And being so fond of automation has got me in trouble in other ways as well, coming back to the, to the human aspect. So when we do team stand-ups, the, the pattern is often that someone will say, I've done this and this and this, and I'll say, can that be automated? Which is fine the first time, but after two months, I found that people just didn't really like doing stand-ups with me, and they just would say, no, no, don't ask, don't ask, Holly. But there have been some benefits as well. So a while ago, I, um, I was working on a, a customer project, and we really wanted to do the right thing, and so we were doing some automation. And eventually a colleague said, you've, you've got to stop. And I said, but look, look, why do I have to stop? And they pointed out, because we are a services organization and, and we work by contract, that the contract had finished some time ago, and I was still trying to fix this customer problem and introduce automation into their system that legally we weren't really supposed to be tinkering with anymore. Um, so I was sort of... I, eventually, I, he did manage to get me away from the keyboard to, to stop automating it, you know, but he had to drag me by my fingernails. So I, I don't know why I described that as a benefit, actually. I think that probably wasn't a benefit for anybody. But this one, this one is a benefit. So I, I, I joined a new team, and I'd been working in it for a while, and, and my team lead, Alistair, gave me a problem. And we, what we had to do, we were, um, we were working with Apache open source, but we were including it in WebSphere. And because it's WebSphere and because it's IBM and because of the, the kinds of guarantees that our customers expect from us, if they come to us with a problem in five years and seven years, we've got to be able to fix it. And we can't say, oh, well, we got the code from the internet and the repo disappeared and so whatever. I'm sure it's only a bank. Nobody cares, right? So. We, what we had to do when we would use open source was we'd have to make sure that we had a local copy of it that we could put in our big IBM vaults for serviceability so that if we ever needed to make a change, we had the source. 
And so every time we wanted to reconsume something from open source that we contributed to, we'd have to do this really tedious process of taking the source, zipping it up, putting it here, putting it there, putting a link to it there, all that. And it, it wasn't very much fun. So it came round to my turn to do that. So I looked at this and I said, no way. So I automated it. And I went back and I said, look, 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 I fixed this problem. Instead of having this really manual process that we almost never did, I made it so that it was just a button click and we could keep up to date. And the response wasn't what I was expecting, because I was expecting sort of a pat, 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 well done, Holly, that's very nice. And instead, what Alistair said is, I give you all the worst jobs. And I thought, what? That's not fair. How's that? It, that just, that's so fundamentally unfair. But then it made, well, it still wasn't fair, but it sort of made sense. Because what he said was, if he gave a bad job to someone else, they'd do it. If he gave a bad job to me, I'd find a way to automate it so that no one else then would have to do it. So the whole team would, would benefit. But of course, I don't want to say that I'm the only person who loves automation. Because of course, as, as a species, really, this is a journey that we've been on for a while. So I've got sort of a a slightly simplified timeline of human history. Please don't use this for revision purposes or for exams. But you know, sort of, it started with fire. And then from there, does, does anybody know what this is? Mm -hmm. Very close. Yeah, it's called, it's called a spinning jenny. So it's the stage before a loom where you take the, the big fluff of sheep's wool and then you need to spin it out into yarn. And what this did is it took the job that could be, that used to take one person, and it did eight people's work. So that caused some disruption, but it, it was a big saving. This one, slightly more recognizable as I've drawn it, although I don't think it would be recognizable to the people of 1858. The washing machine was actually a huge labor-saving device, because I don't think we realize now, when we just put clothes in, that before we had washing machines, it was really labor-intensive, because you had to apply a lot of mechanical effort to every single piece of clothing in order to try and get it scrubbed up enough, and clothes are heavy, so they're wet, so it was a horrible, horrible job, and the washing machine fixed that. Skipping forward slightly, ballistic calculations, that kind of thing, very time-consuming job, computers were able to, to make them far, far faster. Skipping forward a bit more, we have things like Chef that again take some of these tasks that we find quite tedious, automate them. Then Chef wasn't good enough, so then we went to Docker. So you know, in 2014 we had stuff like Docker. And really we, we were on this journey where we're automating more and more and more. So then the question is, well, great. We're living the dream, right? Everything's getting better. Well, in terms of laundry, yes. In terms of other things, maybe not so much. So who's had a similar experience to this? This is, it's um, slightly blurred, because I decided I shouldn't put my child's face all over the internet. But what this is, is about 15 copies of the exact same image. Because somehow our photo management process ended up with it getting imported, and then imported again, and then imported again. And nothing in there was smart enough to say, I shouldn't import the same copy of the image 15 times. Maybe the user would be happier with one copy of the image rather than 15 copies of the image since it's the same image. So it used to be that you know, when, when cameras were film, you'd have a very small number. Now, with digital cameras, we have a huge number of photos that we have to manage. And then with the digital camera management tools, the effect is to somehow multiply that large number of photos to a completely unmanageable volume of duplicated photos. So the, the technology has taken something, and because of the capacity of technology, it's generated far more work than there ever was before, which feels like it's going in the wrong direction. And that really leads me to why we automate. And the reason that we automate <laughs> is fundamentally because we don't want to be doing that. So now photo tools actually have got a bit better and the, the duplicate detection has got a bit better. And it's because we are lazy. The, 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 these things should not be done. They don't have value to be done, so we shouldn't be doing it. But let me give you a, a tip from my 15 years of, of career experience. I found that at annual review time, when you go to your manager and you say, I've been enormously lazy this year, the rating, not so good. So we have to use different phrasing. If, if we say, I've been sustainable, 
I have increased the sustainability of the team, that goes down really well. So that's the sort of things that we want to talk about. We want to talk about sustainability and efficiency. And that, that, that reads well to upper management, but really the fundamental motivation is, if it's boring, automate it. So this is a classic example, which is the server farms. We really, we don't want to be treating our servers like pets, we want to be treating them like cattle. And this is particularly true at scale. So if you have one server, it's fine to coddle it and give it a name. When you have a whole bunch of servers, really it just becomes unmanageable. So our, our build farm when we were in WebSphere was 500 servers. So there was just no way that we could do anything other than full automation of that system. And, and you know, it matters when you're setting them up, and particularly it matters when they go wrong. When you have a problem with one, you need to be able to have it spring back into life with almost no human intervention. Because with 500 servers, they're gonna be going wrong a lot. So really, the more of you there are, the bigger the team, the more you need to invest in automation. So when we were in WebSphere, we had a big investment in automation. In my current team, we tend to work in smaller teams, so we still do automation, but we don't need to have dedicated teams for it because the, the volume of people who drive automation is smaller. But the, the next question is, given that automation is good, given that I'm in a DevOps group, of course we all love automation, when should we automate? And my, my principle, which someone told me, is that the first time you do a task, you just do the task. Maybe you, you know, grit your teeth a bit if it's boring, but you do it. The second time you do the task, you take notes. The third time you, autom you do the task, that's when you know there's gonna be value in automation. It's not worth looking at a task and saying, oh, this is gonna be incredibly boring. I must automate it if it's only actually once in your life that you're gonna go through it. <coughs> and there's other reasons to automate. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> Somewhere, someone watching a video has just had their eardrum perforated. So really, the, the, the best reason to automate is because you care. So if you care about it, automate it. And there, there's a, a subtlety in care. So one really good reason to automate things is just that you care that it happens at all. So when, when we were in WebSphere, we had a problem where everybody was, of course, supposed to run their code, run their tests before they would deliver something to the stream. With hundreds of us, of course, mistakes happened, interactions happened, bad breaks would get, or bad, build, bad stuff would get delivered to the stream, we would have a break. Our policy then was, there's a lot of people affected by this build break, we can't just leave it in the stream. We've got to get it out, we've got to revert that. And then, you know, revert first, ask questions later, figure out what happened. But of course, nobody wanted to be the person who was going to revert the code because that made them the villain and it took them away from their, their work that they should be doing. So the net effect was that it didn't happen and the, bad, the, the breaks just stayed in. So we automated it. So we wrote a tool called Marvin and Marvin was just, it sat there and when a bad build would happen, it would just take the stuff that had gone in, yoink it out and send an email to the perpetrator saying, look, your stuff has come out of the build, figure it out. This is a slightly different example where our, our agile process was that at the end of every iteration, we would do demos. But what happened was some people really liked the sound of their own voice and they'd demo a lot. Other people would do these amazing pieces of work and they wouldn't do a demo, so we'd never get the playback. So what we said was every time someone would close a story, we'd automatically generate a little task that would say, they need to do the demo for this story. And so it would mean that that would be tracked. We could say who is due to do a demo and then we could sign off the demo when it was done. So in this case, really, we were automating to improve the outcome rather than to save effort. Because in fact, we hugely increased the effort. Because first of all, we had to write the automation, which took a little bit of time. And then everybody who did a story had to close the demo tasks, which was a little bit of extra work for them. They had to actually do the demo which was a medium amount of work for them, and the rest of us had to sit through the demo, which was work for us. So in, in terms of effort, it increased the effort, but in terms of the smooth running of the team, it was really beneficial because it meant that we were collaborating more effectively in the way that we intended to. 
Another aspect is about quality. So really, automate because you care that it's done right. Because as humans, we're such fallible creatures that otherwise mistakes just happen. So linting is a classic example of this. In a computer can notice things that a human just can't, particularly a human that's tired. So in the Java world, we absolutely love find bugs. We just run it automatically on every build. Um, I've now, I do a lot of JavaScript, and of course that's even more essential because your potential for errors in JavaScript, it, it's just huge. And you know, so you need to have some kind of automated checking running to catch the errors that the compiler doesn't. Deployment, of course, is a classic DevOps, DevOps example. So what we did with WebSphere Liberty was we really changed our release cycle from a traditional WebSphere <coughs> cycle, and we said, we're going to release every month. And it should have been a pretty easy process to get the build from our build server up to the website. But it just wasn't. So there would always be one step that would get forgotten. It was always a different step, but there was always one step. And then we'd end up in this embarrassing situation where, you know, on the IBM website, we'd have our build, and there'd be something catastrophically wrong, or a piece of metadata missing, or it would be pointing to the wrong version. And it was just a mess. So really, you know, the, the thing that we had to do was we had to automate that process end to end. So that was a really big visible example, but it can be smaller as well. So in the Bluemix garage, we do 100% DevOps. We, you know, the delivery pipeline is always the first thing that we do on a project, but sometimes we get things which are a bit less easy to automate. So a while ago, we did a, a Watson project. So it was doing some quite complex natural language processing. And it had to process it in a different way under different circumstances. So what Bluemix allows you to do is it allows you to bind services to an application. And that's all auto configured. And it's very nice. And it's very idiot proof. But we had an extra layer of configuration on top, which looked a bit like this. <clears throat> and for a while, we were manually generating that. And I think you can see what was going to happen. Be because it was a machine learning process, it would take about 24 hours to train. So we'd have a staging period where we would have kicked off a training, but we wouldn't have started using the results yet. And then we'd have to swap everything over, and we'd have to get all of those IDs associated with the, the right tags. And initially, we sort of thought, well, it would be nice to automate it, but we won't do it yet. And then we had three configuration errors that brought down the website in a week. And then at that point, we said, you know what? Automating this is a higher priority than we thought it was. But finally, the, <clears throat> I think this is a reason for automating that I don't put in my performance appraisals, a bit like the laziness one. But I think it is important, which is just really we automate because it's fun. The, we're so lucky to be in the roles that we're in, I think, and I think we're so lucky that our jobs are enjoyable and that we do have this potential to do this enormously satisfying task, which is automating stuff that would otherwise be boring for us <coughs> and for our colleagues. But of course, we, we don't always get there. A bit like the example with the Watson configuration, where we knew we needed to do it, but we had too many other pressures on us, so we didn't do it. There's sometimes there, there's this problem. So my colleague Ross, he said, I get so mad at how much time I could save if I had more time. But we don't have time to do the automation that's going to save us the time. So it's, the, it's this bootstrapping problem where we, if only we could do the automation, everything would be amazing. So I like to think of this as the automation paradox, where we can't harvest the value because we haven't harvested the value. And as well, you know, sometimes, sometimes automation is hard even in, in trivial cases. So we had, we had quite a complex class path, and we had quite complex dependencies. And they were written down in little files, as you'd expect, which was fine when there was one. We'd need to update a dependency. We'd update it. But at one point, we had to update 26 identical class paths. So that ended up being quite a lot of class paths to update. And I thought about this, and I thought, this is clearly an ideal task for automation. And then I thought, how am I going to automate it? And years ago, I'd written a series of scripts to, um, to run sed for me, because I could never remember where the input was and where the output was. And then to do it for a set of files, it didn't work, and, or you know, it, need, it needed special handling. 
And of course, find something, find is ideal for this, but the find syntax, I always need to go look it up. And yeah, sed just ends up complicated in loops. And then I, this, this setter script was the sed script I had, but then I'd lost it. And then I, Perl is great for this, but then I've never really mastered Perl, so then that was sort of hard. So eventually, what happened? was we had a new graduate in the team and I was in a relatively senior position. And so I said, Kate, I have an opportunity for you. And Kate didn't know any better. So she said, well, I think she, she thought probably this wasn't the sort of thing that you, know, you could say no to, because if we said no to everything boring we got asked, our careers might not last very long. So Kate said, fine. So Kate did it. But there is an epilogue to this, which I have more for my own reference because I can never find it which is that this is the Perl incantation to do batch replace. But more generally, you know, it, it is the case that even though in that situation there was the one-liner and I could have invested the half day to find the one-liner, sometimes our hopes for automation don't quite end up matching the reality. And I saw this on a colleague's wall and my heart just sank because I thought, you've just described my life. And <laughs> I don't want it to be that way. But we have, we have this dream, right, where we say, I spend a lot of time on this task. I should write something to automate it. And what we think is going to happen is that we're going to invest a little bit of a bump. And then the automation is going to take over, and we're going to have all this free time. But what actually happens is we, start, we invest in the automation, and then we think we're done. But then we discover a whole bunch of problems. So then we resume work. And then we discover a whole bunch of problems. And then we discover some missing features. And then we continue working on the automation. And the original task doesn't happen at all. So that was exactly the case, for example, with my one where I said, I know I can automate the generation of our design documents. It, it didn't have the productivity boost that I hoped it for. So you know, we think we're going to have this automation that's going to be doing it all for us while we drink beer. But what actually ends up happening is we end up supporting this thing. It's not doing any work, and we're doing a ton of work. So you know, when you do an automation, you've got to think about what happens to it tomorrow. What, what's the support like? What's the robustness of this thing going to be like? We had um, another tool that we wrote where we, we wanted to manage some of our process and automate some of our service checklists and that kind of thing. So <clears throat> we invented a tool called Rosie. And Rosie was just going to be a little thing that was just going to you know, run on check-in and just do a few little checklists. What ended up happening was that Rosie absolutely <laughs> ate the world. So there was a time when I did stuff that wasn't Rosie. And then there was a period of about six months where I did nothing but Rosie. So there's two lessons here. The first is that if you're going to write a really big automation, you've got to give it a good name. So I've heard of um, things like Conan the Deployer, very good, Rosie good, Marvin good. And that means that when you talk to your manager and he says, why are you looking so tired? You can say, oh, well, you see, it's rosy because I've been working on it all night. So that's the thing. But more seriously, you do need to ask questions. So you need to think about who can maintain this automation, who can manage the automation, how much is it going to cost, both of my time that maybe I put you know, under the under the books, but you know, other people's times as well. And you know, is this going to be robust? If things change, what happens to this automation? And then during the automation as well, you've got to keep asking these questions. So how do I define success? Because one of the problems we had with Rosie was that there was a never-ending list of new features. And so we were never actually finished. And so the, the completion criteria just didn't exist. So then there was a point as well where we had to say, is this actually still worth it? Because am I saving time, or have I just actually lost people to developing automation that is, isn't going to save more than a person's time? So really, I, th I think it's so easy to get sucked into a problem once, we, you know, once we're working on it. We say, yeah, I'm going to make it work. But you've got to keep your perspective and say, is it still worth it? And, and this is particularly important in a team environment. So even if you write this amazing automation, if it's so complex that you're the only person that understands it, when the bus comes, your team's going to be in trouble. So lesson one, avoid buses. Lesson two, think about the broader team. So uh, there's a whole bunch of other reasons not to automate as well, which aren't just about time. So automation allows us to do dumb things with ever greater speed. But really, we should be thinking, should I automate this process? 
or should I change it? Because it's dumb to automate dumb things. Just because you've automated it doesn't make it any less dumb. So we had an example, again, in, in WebSphere where we had a defect triage process. So the defects would come in, and then a select group of us would meet every day to say, how serious is this defect? Every single defect got assigned a should. And so eventually we said, I know. Why don't we write an automation to auto set the field to should? Yeah. And the, the correct answer really was, why do we even have this field if it's so meaningful, meaningless that a tool could set the value? So you know, there it would have just been such a waste of time to try and automatically set this meaningless field. So you know, definitely ask questions before automating things that you shouldn't even be doing. Another aspect is that even though we're all very clever. Computers don't always get things right. So I haven't embedded the video for this, but it is, I don't know, have any of you seen this? <laughs> it, it is worth going and looking at this, because this was, um, I think it was, I think Walkers might have done it as sort of a promotional thing, actually. And the idea was that it was a, an automation to feed someone crisps, but it wasn't quite right. So what happens was it ends up, the robotic arm basically ends up punching the person in the nose repeatedly, and they never get the crisps. So, you know, that, that's an example. We had a, a similar issue when we thought about build monitoring because we, it was a really tedious job and we wanted to automate it, but then we realized that it, the leaps of intuition that were required to figure out the connection between a root cause and a failure were too hard for a computer to do, at least without a massive investment. So the, you know, it would be things like a network failure somewhere over here would cause some of the tests to fail, and it would be a quite a subtle connection between the tests, and a, a person could see that, and a computer couldn't. So in, in the end, we ended up doing that manually. But there is um, a bit of an elephant in the room, which is DevOps, because of course this is a DevOps meeting. So as I said, in the Bluemix Garage, we're very keen on DevOps. We've designed what we call the, the Bluemix Garage method, and you can see that the URL actually does say DevOps in it, even though it includes a bunch of other things like Lean Startup, Agile Development. <coughs> and, and this has been recognized within the industry as a very good process. So we got the DevOps Dozen winner for the Bluemix Garage method. So not relevant, but very cool. So I had to put that in. But then more, more generally, I've, I've been talking about automation in general. And then there's a question about what is DevOps. And I think I'm probably going to get myself in a little bit of trouble here, because I think you all have a very good idea of what DevOps is. And a team, two teams, we'd have the team of people who broke stuff, and we called them the developers, and I'm in this group. And then we'd have the group of people who dealt with the consequences, and they would be the ops team. And the developers were generally a cheery lot, and the ops team were generally less happy because they had all of this broken stuff, and they had deadlines, and it was a fairly unhappy situation. What DevOps has allowed us to do is to merge these two teams. <laughs> and so now we have the DevOps team. And then ideally, we have people who break stuff and deal with the consequences and, and it's the same team. But maybe if, if things go really well, there's fewer breakages as well. And then one consequence of that is that hopefully there's an efficiency which doesn't actually dis result in people disappearing, but just results in them going off and, and doing something more valuable but equally well paid. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, <laughs> oh, DevOps, you know, I think for, for me, it's really, it is about automation. And in particular, it's about 100% automation. Um, there are other definitions of, of DevOps. So how many of you, um, now this is where I get myself into, into lots, of, lots of trouble. How many of you have DevOps in your job title? OK, so I'm, so I'm only in three people's title, um, three people's trouble, because I think DevOps really shouldn't be a, dev, a job title. And in particular, it shouldn't be a job title for the IT department where you just rebrand it and say it's DevOps and nothing else in the organization changes. I think that if you're doing that, you're doing it wrong. Um, I had 
a situation where I was working, I think it might have actually even been this presentation, I was working on a presentation on the train, so I had DevOps written in big letters on the screen, and someone came over to me and he said, oh, do you do DevOps? We're, we're hiring a DevOps team. And again, I thought, well, if you're hiring a DevOps team, I'm not sure I want to work for you because if you have the little isolated team that you call the DevOps team and they don't interact with the developers and they don't interact with the rest of the organization, again, you're doing it wrong. Um, and in particular as well, if finding strange people on the train is your recruitment technique, I, I think you're doing it wrong. But, and, and as well, you know, we, we talk about DevOps so much now and there's a whole bunch of stuff that we used to do that's sort of been piled into the, this DevOps basket. And it may be, being the, the bearer of bad news, you know, maybe in five years we'll be so over DevOps. And, you know, the Oxford DevOps meetup, people will be like, oh, remember when we went to the DevOps meeting? How lame. You know, and, and we'll be doing something else instead. But when that happens, all of this good stuff and all of this automation, we shouldn't be stopping doing because it does have value in itself. And the, the principles of trying to eliminate waste and trying to eliminate boredom are good ones. So I've got, I've got a section on tools and that kind of thing, but I think there definitely you, you do have more expertise than me, so I'll, I'll leave it there in the interests of time, but I'm very happy to take questions. The time saving. Mm. Uh, the thing that appeals to me for automation, is maybe, and maybe it's the control freak in me, is that it's the opportunity to control. It's the opportunity to stop bad things happening and stop other people making mistakes. Yeah. 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 So the question that was that I, I talked a lot about automation, but there's a, a control aspect as well that what op automation allows us to do is to stop bad things happening. And I think you're exactly right. I think I think there's a couple of drivers. So one is the efficiency. Um, one is the fun because these automation challenges can be interesting and they can be tricky problems and subtle problems but then you're absolutely right that the stopping bad things happening is a, is a key part of it because if we do things manually we make mistakes if our colleagues do things manually they make a lot of mistakes so we want to make sure that we remove that opportunity for error and that we have a process where we know exactly what it was and even if it wasn't necessarily the right process we can then look back at the script and we can say this is what happened and this is why it wasn't maybe quite the right thing to do but I understand what had happened whereas if Bob did it who knows what Bob was thinking and yet any other questions hopefully none of you are called Bob <laughs> yes Bob <laughs> There's an awful lot of different things for automating here. Do you have a bit of a toolbox of your sort of preferred tools for automating? I, or, is, or is it more you, you have to do it one by one and... I, I do. Yeah, so, you, so this does... Uh, funny you should ask. So the question was, have I got a toolbox? And the answer is... Dun, 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 oh, animation slowing me down. Um, ding, 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 Yep, no, so, so <laughs> let me just whiz forward. So, so my toolbox is, I mean, I think there's, there's so many different tools and I think all of us have our preferred tools. And one of the things when I was thinking about tools, I think it's useful thinking about the, some of the tools that we may use. There's the classic ones, right? So we say, oh yes, I'm gonna do Chef, I'm gonna do Docker, I'm gonna do Kubernetes. But then there's some other ones that maybe are equally useful that we hadn't thought about. So, you know, there's the classic stuff, shell scripts. Um, so I've got set and awk. As I said, I avoid set and awk. I just use shell scripts. Python and Ruby, again, I avoid Python and Ruby, but I do do scripting. Um, <laughs> the, the reason I was looking in such shock at the slide trying to figure out what it shows is, is because when I put it in it was a bit of a learning to me so I, we as I said our team do a lot of JavaScript and JavaScript is quite new to me and I hadn't really realized that you can use node as a very effective scripting tool and if that's the language you're used to which as I just demonstrated is not necessarily the case for me it can be a really effective way of uh, of doing some scripting that you can just you know put the magic incantation at the beginning and, and then you can do quite complex things um, some things I think as well that we think of, of as tools have some issues so of course Jenkins is a classic you know, build pipeline tool. But what we found with Jenkins, it has changed now. 
but we found that Jenkins gave us massive snowflake machines and we couldn't take our Jenkins pipeline from one machine to another machine and so we had the special build machine in the corner and no matter how we tried to put it on virtual machines it still somehow got its tentacles into the into the core machine and we could never put it anywhere else so it was this huge vulnerability in our DevOps system that's got a lot better now um, and again you know there's others like Travis and, and and concourse and rational team concert, that kind of thing. Um, so what I find Docker sort of an interesting example because we, a few years ago, we were all talking about Docker as automation tools. And now we talk about Docker as an automation problem. And really what we need is something like Kubernetes to, to handle the automation. So I, I think that's probably the case with a lot of tools that we find tools to manage our tools to manage our tools. But as well, in, in terms of tools, it doesn't necessarily have to be fancy. I, I think as technologists, we're always drawn for the most, uh, not necessarily the most complicated solution, but the solution that's going to impress people down in the bar the most, which often is the most complicated solution. And, and what our IT department did was they didn't do virtual machines. They, they, you know, they had a, a, a on-call phone, when you got the call, you had to be able to fix the problem immediately. There was quite complex setup that was needed, but they didn't do a virtual machine. They did a physical laptop. And so when you were on call, you got the physical laptop and then you just fired it up. And it was incredibly unsophisticated in terms of, you know, they weren't using any of the modern tools, but it was incredibly effective as well because no one could ever say, I can't bring up the IT infrastructure because the virtual machine's behaving a bit funny. You know, we all knew it worked. Um, build scripts, of course, very useful. And I think one of the things with these is they're tools that we all use, but if you get to know it really well, there's a lot of power there that the basic form doesn't have, and it's worth getting to know maybe one tool. Get, well, my view is it's worth getting to know one tool, getting to know it really well, and then that's perhaps better than being able to do the same task in 16 different tools. Um, Chatbots, of course, now as well are, are very useful. And the advantage they have, I think, is a communication one. So in the example here, you can see someone, um, someone has interacted with the chatbot. So this is the chatbot, which is um, it's for our build train. And so it was called the Fat Controller. And so they've, they've interacted with it. And because it was on a public chat channel, everybody else could see, oops, go back. Everybody else could see how they interacted with it. So it was a really useful way of learning within the team because it was done in public. Whereas when we do something super crazy with a script by ourselves or something super crazy with keyboard shortcuts, even if we're pair programming, that knowledge doesn't necessarily transfer. So I think I'll, I'll whirlwind tour of, of tools, but I think I've perhaps given an answer about my preferred tools and also some of the, the range of tools that are out there that I'm not clever enough to use. Any other any other questions? Yeah. Um, I got a bit obscure, but I wonder if you have any tips uh, for things that you might do with your team to help build a culture of responsible automation. Ah, oh, that yeah, that's a really good question. So the question was, are there things to do with a team to build a culture of responsible automation? And I, my first thought was, oh well, you can be an example and you can automate things. But of course, if you take that too far, then you get the problem that I talked about at the beginning, where every boring task goes to the person who's good at automation. And if you take it too far as well, then you could get into the sort of the the pub-driven automation as well, where you get people trying to come up with the irresponsible automations, the increasingly occult things that will impress their colleagues because they be now become indispensable and you know, hopefully get a pay rise because no one else can, can do the automation. So the short answer, well, that was the long answer, and the short answer is no. I, I think it's a really good question. <laughs> and, and it's sort of a workflow problem, isn't it? So if you do pull requests, code reviews, force them to write tests around the automation, they're going to write them. Yeah, so the, so the comment was that it's a, a workflow problem and then when you get it in your workflow with the pull requests and the tests and that kind of thing, that, that helps. And, and you're absolutely right. So we do 100% we do pair programming and I think one of the big advantages of that is that we also do 100% test-driven development. And there's such a strong temptation with test-driven development to say this is too boring to test. But if you have your pair sat over your shoulder going <coughs> then you find that suddenly it's not as boring as you thought it was and just that little bit of peer accountability and getting it into the workflow then, then can help 
avoid these unautomated gaps. And I, I think, Hannah, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, you said that the, um, the, was it the Brew Mix Garage? Yeah. Uh, won awards for your flavour of DevOps. I was wondering if you could pick out a couple of things that you think were the differentiating things for you that make a real difference. I, th I think a lot of what we've done is not necessarily uh, inventing anything new, but pulling things together that hadn't been pulled together and making it a prescriptive methodology that we could say, this is our method and we believe if you do this, this and this, you'll be successful. And a lot of it as well was I think about the, the documentation. So we have the website where we've got a whole bunch of practices that are that are laid out from both the really small scale projects to the, you know, the, some of the larger projects where you're going to want to use say for something like that. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I think, yeah. I, yeah. I just, no, it's good that you're being so transparent. I haven't actually read that website. Yeah. Oh, oh, um, so for how many of the, uh, what would you say is the bar for, uh, well, now this is actually the wrong process and we should change it versus let's automate a dumb thing. So. Yeah, so the, the question was where is the bar for the difference between um, let's automate this process and this is a dumb process, let's not automate it. And that's going to depend on your organization. So in the, in some cases it's so hard to change the dumb process that it's actually more time effective to automate it. In other cases it is worth pushing back and, and talking to the people who manage the process and saying, look, you need to stop us doing that. And I, so I, th I think the, the answer probably it's about time in terms of how much time will be spent trying to change the process versus how much time will be spent being a sheep and going along the process with the process. But also one, I think, of impact to the team. So if, even if it was more time effective to automate the process, if the effect on team morale is that everybody sees that we're still doing this dumb process in a slightly more automated way, that's going to be depressing. So in that case, I think it's worth saying, no, we've got to do the right thing and we have a responsibility to one another to push for doing the right thing because once you have that culture of doing the right, well, once you create a culture of doing the wrong thing, that then is a culture that's easy to, to perpetuate and do other wrong things and that's not good for anybody. Any other questions? Yeah. Question. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. yeah. um, a couple of things. First, firstly, um, going back to one of your slides, um, the stuff on Rosie. Don't be, don't be ashamed of having a whole lot of Rosie. Very good thing. <laughs> don't get that to you too young. Um, more seriously, um, the, the problem I see here is that this ecosystem is changing so rapidly. New tools are coming along every, every month, every, every few months, and these tools are very complex. Look at, look at how Docker has gone from nothing and is taking over the whole world in just a, few, just a few years. How do you cope with th th this problem of ever-changing ecosystem and at the same time ever, com ever more complex things and ever steeper learning curves to get up to speed? So the risk is you spend all your time getting up to speed with learning something and then finally it's being replaced with the next cool thing. Yeah, I think that, that's a great question as well. So the, the question was about the ecosystem because our ecosystem of, of tools is changing so rapidly that you can get to grips with one, but then things have, you blinked and things have changed and it's coming along. And I think that that is such a real problem. So I, and you can see that a little bit in some of the tools that I was talking about. So for example, we, um, we do a bit of Chef, but we don't do Chef directly. Instead, we manage all of our machines with Sprout Wrap, which is something that's been built on top of Chef. But actually, Sprout Wrap is causing us a lot of problems because it's flaky and it stops working and then we have to spend time figuring out why our machines aren't in sync with each other because something went wrong with the Sprout Wrap automation. And in that case, the, we have a layer of automation, then we have a layer of automation to simplify the automation, and soon we're going to have to have a Sprout Wrap monitor to see if Sprout Wrap's running. And it's a bit the same with, it's a different example, but it's a bit the same with Docker, that we have to have things to manage our Docker now, and soon, you know, then there's the cloud brokers to manage our clouds. And so the, again, the answer, I think, is... I don't know. I think I think we have to be just aware of the problem because it's so easy to get into the slippery slope of saying, well, this is a bit hard, so let me add a wrapper around it, and not really thinking about the fact that we've just built up 15 wrappers, and maybe sometimes it is worth stepping away from that and thinking, well, what problem are we trying to solve, and should we actually strip out some of these layers instead of adding more layers on top? But that's it's always easier to add stuff than to strip stuff out, I think. 
So I think that that's it for the questions. But, okay. yep. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you.